I hope you enjoyed today's playlist. Personally, I like the fights from Russia and faraway climbs. It reminds me of my days back in the 90s when I'd have to wait for the VHS tapes to come in the mail with fights from all around the world, Brazil, Russia, even Israel at one point. Japan, of course, was a favorite. They'd all come in the mail. I'd order them from Hook and Shoot fanzine, all bootlegged, all illegal, VHS, and uh, it was fun as hell. That's where I saw most of my first uh, UFC fights, my first Shudo fights, my first International Valley Tudo fights. IFC, IVC, uh, UWC, WCC, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was awesome, and I think seeing, finding those random fights from around the world on YouTube kind of brings me back to those days. I hope you can enjoy some of the sense of discovery. And talking about discovery, yesterday, or like, actually last Friday, UFC CEO Lorenzo Fertitta, one of the two uh, owners of the majority owners of the UFC, along with his brother Frank Jr., was talking about their efforts to expand into India, where they'll be launching a new season of The Ultimate Fighter featuring a, a cast made up entirely of Ameri of Indian or Indian-descended fighters, and that'll be airing on Indian television. This comes on the heels of The Ultimate Fighter Australia, which is filming now and about to debut, and The Ultimate Fighter Brazil, which debuted last season and was hugely successful in Brazil. Of course, here in America, The Ultimate Fighter is, at best, a stag stagnant franchise with the ratings for the season debut low, failing to break the million viewer mark, and um, there's only one direction they go from there, and that's down. So we'll see how... We'll see how things go with the Ultimate Fighter in the U.S., and hopefully they'll turn that around. But today I want to talk about international expansion of the UFC. Right now, they're doing very well in Brazil. They've had a number of events. They're about to have UFC 153 there. They had UFC um, 147 there, which was not a success on American pay-per-view, but did reasonably well as the capper to a hit season of the Ultimate Fighter in Brazil. Unfortunately, an injury to Vitor Belfort forced the cancellation of the fight fans wanted to see, which was Vanderlei Silva and Vitor Belfort and difficulties in, in finding an appropriate stadium venue prevented the Brazilian Stalker Stadium uh, Anderson Silva versus Shell Sonne main event that they had hoped to have. They had to move. Forgive the cutaway, please. I had to sneeze, so I cut that out. Anyway, back as I was saying, I've had a number of successful events in, the, in Brazil in the last 18 months. Um, some more successful than others, but uh, Vitor Belfort, Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva have all emerged as genuine pop culture stars. There's uh, ju <clears throat> Champions Junior Dos Santos and Jose Aldo are on the verge, and uh, all of that is going very well. The Australian expansion, they've had a couple of events there, UFC 110 comes to mind. Uh, done very well at the gate, it remains to be seen how uh, the Tough Smashes series plays on Australian television. And Australia is an incredibly small market, so even if they do incredibly well there, it's more or less uh, the size of uh, Vancouver, uh, maybe. So, um, you know, the whole continent. I mean, so, you know, Australia is not going to be a huge ground for expansion. India, on the other hand, is an enormous country, the world's second most populous country, over a billion people, maybe even pushing two billion people in that country. It's a very poor country, although their middle class has emerged in the last decade as a sizable force, one of the world's largest middle classes. And all indications uh, are that India will only become more prosperous in the future as they expand into software, uh, continue to improve their agriculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see why it's an attractive market to the UFC. They also believe that India's traditional uh, affinity for wrestling sports, particularly the native form of wrestling called kushti, which involves wrestling in a mud or clay pit, and though it's not usually important, uh, popular at the moment, it's kind of atrophied in the last uh, 100 years or so, it's still a huge cultural touchstone, and a lot of Indians are familiar with it, and they think that that will make India more receptive to uh, the ground fighting that you so often see in MMA. Might have some points there. On the other hand, let's look at what happened when they tried to expand into England. Now, England had, had been a bustling uh, UFC market or MMA market in the early part of this uh, decade or the previous decade, around 2000. I think they had UFC 38 was uh, held in England uh, early in the Zufa, Zufa era, but they um, didn't come back heavily until uh, 2007 when um, they, they held a number of events there. I'm thinking of the BJ Penn versus Joe Stevenson title fight, most notably the Rampage Henderson versus Rampage Jackson versus Dan Henderson. Uh, UFC light heavyweight title fight, which was a, a huge hit, very big, a very popular event watched in England. That a number of events, uh, Michael Bisping headlining an event in London against Matt Hamill, so on and so forth. However, they've since throttled it way back. They've gone from having four or five events and talking about having six or seven events a year in England to having one event this year in Nottingham. 
on Fuel TV. And, and I think that what happened was that the original plan was for HBO to uh, sign a deal with the UFC that would carry the international fights on HBO. A beautiful solution. They, the fights wouldn't have to be on pay-per-view. They could air on HBO live as they happened. They'd still be premium content for HBO, and that would pay the freight so that they could afford to pay for top-notch fights to happen in the UK. Instead, what happened is after the Jackson and Penn championship fights, once the fighters learned that what a pay cut they took by not fighting on a major pay-per-view. I think the Jackson fight was on spike uh, on reruns, and the pin fight was on pay-per-view, but greatly diminished because it was live in the afternoon. Um, champs just wouldn't fight there anymore. And then you had the problem of British fighters not adapting well to wrestling, so guys like Michael Bisping and Dan Hardy had a natural ceiling to their growth as uh, athletes and couldn't, couldn't, you know, we have yet to see an English athlete earn a title, well, Hardy got a title shot, but he got blown out. Bisping still hasn't earned a title shot, so I haven't seen a UK athlete come anywhere near a UFC title. And of course, uh, the potentially great Lee Murray ruined his career and life by, uh, planning and pulling off one of the biggest uh, bank heists in the UK history and is now rotting in a Moroccan jail, which is probably where he belongs. Nevertheless, it's a huge loss to MMA. The guy had charisma and talent out the wazoo, fought Anderson Silva nearly to a standstill in a five-round fight. I think I think we'd still be watching Lee Murray fight if he hadn't blown it horribly by making some terrible decisions and revealing himself to be a completely morally bankrupt person, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, the short of it is that the UFC tried to expand into England, sunk a ton of money into it with promotions, uh, putting fights on there that that cost them a lot of money. If they put Rampage versus Hindo on in the U.S. or Penn versus Stevenson, they would have made a lot more money. Anyway, they they were not able to to land the big TV deal they needed in the UK to really root in and also hit hit some uh, snags with the shady way business is conducted there in the fight promotion game. There's no athletic commissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. With England collapsing, that meant their launch into Europe, which was already problematic, just stalled out. They, they put on two events in Germany, lost their German TV deal, uh, ran into uh, some situations reminiscent of the McCain era in the U.S., the human cockfighting era, where Germans just strongly objected to cage fighting, banned it from TV, and uh, and those two events are probably going to be the last UFCs in Germany for some time to come. They've done well in, in Sweden. I expect that... Uh, they, they could do well in Norway and Finland as well, but Scandinavia is a terribly small market. They've never pulled off an event in Italy. Holland, historically a hotbed of MMA, home of Boss Root and Alistair Overeem, Gilbert Evel, and others, um, has has really had some right-wing governments that have cracked down, not just on MMA, but on kickboxing. Uh, there's been some criminal linkages to uh, Dutch kickboxers linked to drug cartels. It's really hurt the reputation of the sport in Holland. So Holland's out. France still bans uh, full contact MMA. Spain's, Ital Spain's economy is cratered. Italy's economy is cratering. So I don't expect to see the UFC expanding into Europe anytime soon or continuing their expansion into Europe. Not, I, I think they'll continue to get their toes wet, but they're not going to be all in like they were in England from 2007 to 2009, which means just because they expand into a market doesn't mean they're going to succeed. I think they'll succeed in Australia, but that's a very small market. With Brazil, I think they've still got quite a bit of upside, although there's some risks. We've seen you know, a lot of fight cancellations. Jose Aldo just had to pull out of another fight at UFC 153. They managed to get Anderson Silva against Stefan Bonner as a last-minute substitute, which is great. But we'll just have to see how long they can continue to sustain that momentum, hopefully uh, for the next three to five years. That would be awesome. Get uh, MMA truly entrenched in Brazil as a true sport rather than the boom and bust cycle that's been locked in in Brazil since the 1920s, where since the days of Helio Gracie, occasionally there would be a huge fight that caught the popular imagination, sold a lot of tickets, got a lot of media coverage, then there would be a backlash, and, and things fell apart. They did it again in the 1950s when they were on network TV, had some in-studio brawls, got banned, uh, you know, came back again in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, never really uh, developed too much momentum, uh, came back again in the 80s a little bit, had a little boom in the 90s. All of those things uh, were then beaten back, and, and so... This time, hopefully, it's finally going to break through in Brazil as a true sport with some cultural legitimacy, so it won't be as prone to the bus cycle. India, man, I do not know. I do not. I don't. Uh, if they could pull that off, that will be uh, truly that will get them in the Harvard Business Journal because that would be a huge feat. And then, as far as China, they're putting on UFC Macau in China later this year with Rich Franklin versus Kung Lee headlining. 
that's just a little bit of a toe wet. It's a huge market, but it's very difficult to do business in China. It's a, run by a criminal communist dictatorship that, and it's no joke, it's still a communist dictatorship. People get murdered, as, as we've seen an English businessman murdered by one of the top, the wife of one of the top ranking Chinese officials last year. And currently the regime is uh, going through some shakeups. Things are opaque. There's extreme tensions with Japan. All in all, China is not the place I would be wanting to do business right now. And as for Japan, historically, the world's largest market for MMA through the late 90s and, and early the first half of the 2000s. And uh, the Japanese market has completely collapsed. So UFC put on UFC 144 there. Now there's some talk about putting on some minor events there next year, but otherwise the MMA scene, the entire combat sports scene in Japan, with the exception of some boxing and Olympic judo, has completely cratered. I'm even talking about sumo wrestling has been caught in scandals linked to the Yakuza and seriously damaged. So Japan, and you know, with Japan's economic troubles, aging population, et cetera, et cetera, I wouldn't look to Japan to be a growth market anytime soon for MMA. So the UFC is making the best of the options they've got, but so far blocked in England, fa failed in Europe, going gangbusters in Brazil, expanding into the small market that's Australia, Japan, a lost cause, which is a huge loss for worldwide MMA, no hint, uh, a tiny, tiny bit of expansion into, into China, the aggressive plans in India, no hint of being able to work in Russia, which is continuing to have a, a relatively thriving MMA scene. Um, not what it was, say, 15 years ago, but still uh, uh, doing pretty well there. Um, but, but very difficult to do business in the, US, in the former USSR, and, and the UFC has found that to be impossible. Anyway, a rather long-winded rant featuring my first mid-rant edit. So I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll be back tomorrow with more Your MMA of the Day. This is Nate Wilcox of Bloody Elbow. Thanks a lot.